Governor Polis, thank you so much for making the time for us today. Uh, so we want to we want to talk through a few issues, the same same types of things we talked to your opponent about uh, earlier today. And we'll start with the economy. I mean, one of the biggest challenges arguably, arguably you'll be going through in a second term would be a possible recession. We already have high inflation. We're seeing uh, the Leeds School of Business uh, quarterly outlook just released, uh, had some pessimistic views from business owners saying they'll likely have to increase costs, pass those on to customers. Um, we could face job cuts or at least a slowing job market here. Uh, so are you prepared and, and how will you tackle the challenges that a likely recession will bring on? Thanks, Nicole. Happy Halloween to mm -hmm. you. Uh, you know, who knows what the future will bring. What I can tell you is that Colorado is in the strongest budget situation we've ever been in. We've doubled our state reserves, mm -hmm. our rainy day fund since I took office. So we've been uh, tucking away money for a rainy day. Inevitably, the economy goes in cycles, whether that's in one year or five years. You know, talk to five economists, they'll give you eight different opinions, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but we're ready. We have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the nation. We're below the national average. Very strong economy. To a certain degree, the challenges that everyday Coloradans face are really come out of our economic success, meaning costs have gone up, like housing, uh, and people are frustrated with the traffic. You know, those are signs the mm -hmm. economy is strong, but we need to do something about the costs that have gone up. So if I have the opportunity to serve for a second term, you're going to see us lean into more housing close to where our jobs are, reducing costs so families can get into home ownership and also have affordable rental opportunities for workforce near where jobs are. I want to talk about housing specifically. I mean, they they would need to drop 32 percent to be as affordable as they were in 2015. Uh, you acknowledged rent costs are up as well. How do you it's especially, you know, you know, I mean, how do you help the, the families who are at the bottom end who are facing rental increases who who can hardly afford a small place to live uh, up, up to the middle ground people who would have been able to afford a house yeah. seven years ago and now they can't and possibly won't be able to if they stay where they are at a six hundred thousand dollar average cost of a home here what do you say to that yeah I, I shared that that just came out a few days ago mm -hmm. uh that study really well done and you you guys covered it and we I sent it to all my senior staff because this is the challenge we face i mean essentially we, we don't have the numbers, but we basically went from about 400000 to about 600000 mm -hmm. for an average house in the metro area, roughly speaking. And obviously, there's areas in our state where it's more expensive than that. Uh, that is coupled with higher interest rates on mortgages. Right. So people's buying power is less. Home prices, they probably stabilize. I don't, they've really gone up in the last few months. Maybe they even go down a little bit, but it's still mm -hmm. effectively they're going up because your mortgage rate is up if you're getting into a new mortgage. So what we need to do is we need to get some of the onerous requirements that suppress the, quality, the quantity of housing out of the way to have more housing close to where jobs are. And also, you know, again, not just any housing. We need housing in the threes and the fours, 300s, 400s. That's what we need, right? I mean, there's mm -hmm. always, you know, going to be demand for people buying million dollar homes and a few here and there. But what we really need are the three and 400s. And then we also need affordable access to rental uh, for people that are an important part of our workforce. We hope they aspire to home ownership someday. Mm -hmm. But, you know, while you're saving up that uh, that down payment, um, you might be in a rental for a while. And we need to make sure that that's also close to where you live. We all benefit because it also means less traffic on our roads and better air quality if we can pull this off. Where do we build these three hundred, four hundred thousand yeah. dollar houses, and how do we build them? Yeah. So what it means is, again, two things. It's on transit corridors. So this is areas where we have bus, light rail service to the job centers. And then the other area is kind of within a mile of job centers. So you don't want to go further and further out. You don't want to say, you want something affordable? You'd, you've got to go out you know, 10 miles east of Keensburg and you can find something for 300. Mm -hmm. Fine, but you have an hour commute. You're on the road. It costs you all that money for gas and it, it leads to more traffic for everybody. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, that's happening. We need to change that paradigm so those more affordable housing options are closer to job centers. And there's multiple job centers across the Denver metro area. It's not just downtown not Denver. Just People that. think, oh, it's downtown Denver. I mean, there's jobs in, in, in Thornton. There's commercial jobs in Broomfield. There's commercial jobs, you know, in Denver Tech Center. I mean, it's kind of all these areas mm -hmm. where we want to give people the opportunity to live close to their jobs. So we're talking about that whole corridor. I mean, a lot of people did move to the suburbs in the pandemic. Uh, that, that, that's played, that, that's sh been shown in, in the rise of rent in the suburbs as well. Um, can, can people live outside of the Denver 
Metro? I mean, we see people wanting to work from home. Is that a solution? Yeah, working from home is, is a great thing. It, it's a great option for many people. I mean, like many employers, you know, we have 31,000 people to work for the state. They do, all, you know, everything from uh, plowing the roads. You can't, you can't telecommute that mm -hmm. to, you know, answering your questions on taxes. You can telecommute that. So we're going to be reducing our state off, our state office space by about mm. a million square feet over the next three years. It's really wow. exciting for me as somebody who comes from the private sector to say, hey, we're no longer going to have that overhead million square feet. We'll have about 20 to 30 percent of our workforce that'll be largely telecommuting. I mean, they'll, they're coming together for, you know, weekly meetings. But, you know, we're able to save taxpayer money and deploy that for our schools for other purposes rather than just have overhead for the sake of overhead. Uh, thank you for, 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 for pointing that out, that that is a solution. Can you influence, do you have any power to influence other businesses to incur, let, let employees work from home if that's a solution? There, very little. I mean, I think that many businesses mm -hmm. are doing that. When I say there is some, so for instance, through our Office of Economic Development and International Trade, this is our kind of state promotion office. We market Colorado. Mm -hmm. By the way, we're doing great. Like every week we're getting new companies that we're putting 200 people, 100 people. I, you know, get to, I can't, there's so many, I can't even go to all the announcements and dedications, but we do prioritize companies companies that have some part of their workforce that allow for location independent. Okay. And so they can live in, you know, Montrose, you can live in Fort Morgan, uh, and many companies, 10, 20, 30 percent telecommuting. So we value that in our state. It, it not, it, for the worker perspective, it has flexibility. That's a wonderful mm -hmm. thing. It also can help uh, improve our economy in our rural communities yeah. because you have a source of income that you can bring in and still live in a place that's maybe an hour and a half from Denver, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe you go in once a week, but that's a commute that's, that's really difficult to do five days a week. I uh, want to talk about crime because that's a, a huge issue weighing on, on voters right now. I mean, uh, we have the, the, the statistic that your opponent likes to point out, but, but, but that's absolutely true, ranking first in the nation in motor vehicle thefts. We've gone up in multiple categories that uh, involve robbery, arsons, uh, vandalism, uh, violent crime is up, uh, in fact, to 40 percent from 2013, according to uh, CBI statistics. How are you going to tackle this increase in crime? Yeah, it is important to confront some of the um, misleading statistics my opponent uses head on. Now, we don't want to paint a pretty picture. It's a real problem. We mm -hmm. have a plan to address it I want to get to. But we're 26th overall in crime. Uh, there's some categories we're lower. There's some categories we're higher. We talked about those. Um, and, and, and this has been a problem nationally with the increase in crime. Um, what we want to do is have a three-planned approach, a three-pronged approach to, to deal with crime. One, and we already started, by the way, um, goal, make Colorado one of the 10 safest states. So number 26, we want to be one of the 10 safest states. We're going to get there. Uh, investing in law enforcement uh, as part of our public safety package. By the way, law enforcement is predominantly local. People know that locally mm -hmm. funded. But the state is now helping. We are sending out grants for recruiting and retaining police officers, right? Number one. Um, number two, tougher penalties on many crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, in auto theft, this is an issue. Uh, we've moved forward with tougher p uh, sentences on fentanyl, for instance, we're one of the first states in the country to create a new class of felony for pill presses. Even if there's just a trace amount of fentanyl, this is what's used to lace fentanyl and with other drugs, poisoning people, costing lives. We're prosecuting those as fentanyl as felony prosecutions. So tougher penalties. Mm -hmm. And third, and in many ways, this is the most important, preventing crime before it occurs in the first place, mm -hmm. right? Um, after it occurs, you want to apprehend the suspect and you want to convict them. But the best way to keep people safe is preventing crime from occurring in the first place. What does that mean? Better mental, mental and behavioral support services for people in need. Mm -hmm. uh, it means a co-response model uh, dealing with people that are a threat. It means making sure we can reduce mm -hmm. recidivism so people who are convicted, they're, you know, they're going to get out of jail, whether it's one year, five years. When they get out, how are they set up for success rather than re-entering the criminal justice system, causing additional crime? Um, how do we make sure we have successful youth intervention programs mm. and youth diversion programs to prevent kids, you know, 16, 17, 18 that are, could go either way. We want them to be productive citizens rather than a life of crime. So it's really a, a comprehensive data-driven approach. I'm a guy that says, show me the evidence, show me what's worked. Mm -hmm. If it's worked in New Orleans or New York or wherever it's worked, wherever it hasn't worked, we're not going to do that. We're going to do what works to reduce crime. So that's how we plan to become one of the 10 safest states. Uh, your, your opponent will, will say that you reduced penalties for, for fentanyl, for example, before you strengthened them. Uh, De Denver Police uh, former Chief Paul Pazin uh, recently told, earlier this year, I should say, told CPR News that, that it wasn't the pandemic, but policies like fewer penalties, lessened penalties, um, uh, lightened penalties that, that have led to an increase in crime. Are you willing to acknowledge that you have done things in the past that possibly 
led to an increase in crime or and, and why the turnaround now? We always you know, want to improve on any mm -hmm. piece of policy that we've done. I mean, I think most people get that when you're dealing with a drug dealer or somebody who's selling poison to our kids or to adults, you want them locked away. When you're dealing with an addict, you want to provide them help. Now, it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that the criminal justice system doesn't have a role. Sometimes, you know, a, a night in jail, a week in jail can help scare somebody straight. Other times, it, it doesn't. But, hmm. you know, there's a role for that. But I, I don't think anybody's saying lock up somebody who's, who just has the addiction side, right? You got to get them out of addiction. I mean, e you know, even if they are I I incarcerated, you need to deal with that substance abuse issue or the minute they get out, they're going to they're going to reoffend. So you really need a comprehensive approach. Mm -hmm. um, really, all I hear from my opponents is sentencing, sentencing, sentencing. Hmm. I mean, I see that as part of an answer. Yes, there's some areas we need absolutely tougher criminal penalties. But if you don't have more police to catch people, my opponent's plan would cut funding for law enforcement slash the state patrol by more than 50 percent with a dedicated funding source uh, with her tax scheme. But if we don't fund law enforcement, then you're never going to get to the part where you're prosecuting and detaining uh, criminals. I want to I want to take two things from that um, law enforcement. I, I, I think it would be very difficult um, to to find a, a tougher job than than putting your life on the line every day. Um, so so hiring bonuses, uh, things like mm -hmm. that. Money is 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 great. But I mean, do they have the support they need the law enforcement agents in our state to want to do that job? They can always use more. I've you know, I've been to too many funerals mm -hmm. for law enforcement officers over yeah. the last few years. Uh, when the family wants, I'm, I'm always uh, honored to attend on behalf of the state if, if they request it. Um, and, and we need to do more as a society to support those who keep us safe, um, our law enforcement officers, our firefighters. You're absolutely right. I mean, pay is part of it, and that's a real part of it. And that's why some of these grants we're giving are used for retention bonuses, for signing mm -hmm. bonuses. But at the end of the day, it is about more than pay. Um, it's also about really supporting uh, our heroes um, that protect us in our communities. Do do we have? I mean, Democrats in recent years have been blamed for for reducing, you know, calling for things like defunding the police. Not to say that you called for that in any way, um, but is is there a, a feeling that our law enforcement is is part of the problem that they're that they're biased that they're going after the wrong people at times, uh, or or do you feel like they get the support in the community and and are treated as the heroes? That Look, they are? there's a lot of people that work in law enforcement, mm -hmm. just like there's a lot of teachers your kids might have at school. Uh, there's a lot of firefighters. There's a lot of people in every occupation. Some are going to perform better than others, mm -hmm. right? We hope that uh, well-run uh, law enforcement organizations, municipal police departments, sheriff's departments, they work, they train, they promote uh, top performers, uh, and they make sure that for people that need corrective action, they, they are able to do that. So, I mean, you know, we have, it's local, fundamentally local in our state. I mean, the mm -hmm. state role, we're helping. Our grants are used for retention, for bonuses, for support. We have our own. We, we increase funding for the Colorado Bureau of Investigations that can assist on many of the more complicated interjurisdictional inter investigations with gangs or multi-county, and especially when serious crimes happen in some of the small counties, they turn to us. We're, we have a, we're investing in a new crime lab. So we're doing a lot as mm -hmm. a state. But people also need to, of course, support their local law enforcement uh, at the municipal level and at the county level. On the subject of, of drugs, fentanyl um, in particular here, one factor is certainly the fact that we have uh, issues at our borders allowing some of that to flood in. Uh, is Colorado's status as a sanctuary state, as it's been labeled, um, impacting that? Are our local agents able to work effectively with the federal government, with, with immigration officials uh, to curb the flow of illegal drugs here? We work very closely with, with ICE, with the FBI on, uh, on interdicting drugs that enter our state. We're not a border state with a foreign country, right? So right. the truth is there are no checkpoints on the New Mexico border, on the Utah border. Mm -hmm. uh, the federal government absolutely needs to do a better job on the U.S.-Mexico border, where particularly a lot of the fentanyl is coming across. And I've been, I've toured two border crossing sites uh, there when I was in Congress. There's new technology, high-tech screening. Uh, we need to get that done. The federal government needs to do that. In the meantime, we have strong relationships with our federal law enforcement partners. Uh, whether some, whether somebody who's smuggling in fentanyl uh, themselves is here illegally or legally doesn't mm -hmm. matter. They're a criminal. Uh, if they're here illegally, they'll be deported. If they're here legally, they will be detained and convicted in our own prison system. I want to talk about um, our air quality here. Just noting that uh, we had a, a nice season of, of, uh, of fewer wildfires, but uh, in the past we've had 
high days of air pollution in Denver. Um, we've had the, that, those summer, a summer a couple years ago when the wildfire smoke was just choking us. Um, you know, how do you how do you make sure we protect our outdoors? I know that the EPA is calling for reformulated gas. You don't see that as a solution necessarily. Why is that and what would you yeah. do instead? There's a lot we're doing. And by the way, this summer we did a better air quality, mm -hmm. which was great news. Now, in, in part, that was due to less wildfires, but we also have been proactive. For instance, we did for this year and next year, free bus passes all of August, right? Yep. And so, and, and some data just came out that showed an increased ridership. No surprise, mm -hmm. you save people money, they're gonna do it more. Uh, we, as we look forward to building roads and bridges and we're investing a record amount, I was just at the, um, Floyd Hill uh, project groundbreaking mm -hmm. uh, two days ago. Very exciting for anybody who goes on Highway 70, that 14 mile stretch, we're adding a lane. Uh, we're also making sure that we're friendly towards people that want to bike, towards transit, towards all these things kind of built in mm -hmm. to help reduce traffic. Housing is also uh, an air quality issue, right? Mm -hmm. The closer people live to where they work and the closer they can afford to live. Look, most people want to, they, they want to live close to work. I mean, very few people say, I really love driving an hour every yeah. day to get to work. It's mostly a cost and affordability mm -hmm. issue. So if we can really drive progress on that, uh, a lot less people will have to travel, which then leaves us less traffic for when we want to travel. Yeah, ultimately, um, though, we, we are likely to see um, reformulated gas at it come into the mix. Yeah, I hope not. Um, that's okay. something that we don't think is helpful. There's other parts of the, e this is a outdated aspect of a, the Clean Air Act that was written decades ago, right? So at mm -hmm. that time, there really weren't electric cars, there weren't um, other ways, you know. So we're saying, and, and we got an encouraging letter back from the EPA saying they kind of want to work with us on this. We would like to avoid mm -hmm. that because the data shows it, it might make a teeny improvement, but it's not worth higher costs for Coloradans. Our whole agenda is centered on saving people money. So that mm -hmm. means preventing people from paying more at the pump is one of the many ways we do that. We reduced property taxes over the next two years, largest property tax cut in Colorado history. So your rate, if you're fortunate enough to be a homeowner, is going down for 23 and 24. Mm -hmm. If I'm reelected, our goal is to find a permanent way to keep property taxes low so people can afford to stay in their homes, even if they do go up in value. Uh, uh you mentioned the RTD study uh, and, and statistics that have come out on, on higher use. Uh, we are still waiting to see if it had any measurable impact on air quality. Uh, if it did, would, would you support uh, more funding to make public transit a, a more viable option for people? I'm a big supporter of, of transit in general, absolutely. So we did this for two years. And, and again, I'm a data-driven guy. So we said, we, we don't know. I mean, there's been different experiments in yeah. different cities. How will it address riders? How will it decrease traffic mm -hmm. and air quality? Two, two functions we want to look at, right? Reducing traffic is great on its own, means less congestion for all of us, and improve air quality. So that's something that we look towards uh, and we're going to be doing this next year for sure. But again, it's encouraging the data so far. Yeah. We're really going to parse through it, learn from it, and see how we can make uh, getting from one place to another even more convenient and kind of empower people with more choices. For people who want to drive, that's great, but we want to empower people with choices, whether that's e-bikes, whether it's bikes, or whether it's bus. Um, abortion became a huge issue in this election after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Uh, so, so we know uh, some of the actions Colorado has taken, and you yourself signed signed a law this year, kind of uh, uh, shoring up protections here. I, I want to ask, um, you know, as we wait to see what the federal government does on this, um, would you would you support a measure that would allow the state? to event to fund abortions. So this has uh, been an issue that is mm -hmm. up to states now. That's why you're hearing everybody yeah. talk about it. So a little context for your viewers. This was protected by the Supreme Court, right to choose, mm -hmm. Roe versus Wade. My entire life, this was before I was born. Mm -hmm. My mom, who's 78, she remembers the pre-Roe versus Wade time. She tells me stories. She went to college in New Jersey. Her college friends, some of them had to travel to other states, all everything they went mm -hmm. through. Many people my generation kind of just grew up assuming we had this freedom, mm -hmm. right? Never had to think about it much. I mean, politicians would talk about it, but it wasn't very real because it was, you know, Roe versus Wade mm -hmm. nationally. Roe versus Wade now been repealed. It's up to states. Yeah. Literally, states that border Colorado, women, nurses, and doctors are facing criminal prosecution and jail time for the choices they make over their own body. One thing I want to make sure Colorado voters know is as long as I'm governor of Colorado, that will not happen here. Would you support... A, 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 as this issue evolves, because I think it will, at the, a, a, as, as we move past Roe versus Wade, that era, as you talked about, um, would you ever support a 
ban abortions after X number of weeks? Well, look, you're, you're, you're talking about, uh, you read a couple hypotheticals you brought up. Yeah. So, what, you know, I'm a data guy. I like to see the okay. policy. You're not going to say maybe, you know, I, I want to see what, what the words are. We all share the goal of mm -hmm. reducing the number of abortions. Mm -hmm. And I think the best strategy to do that is reducing unwanted pregnancies, which means empowering women to, have, to really be able to control their own reproductive health decisions, right? Access to birth control, the importance of consent. All, all of these things are a big part of how we can successfully mm -hmm. reduce the number of unwanted pregnancies uh, and abortions in our state. And, and that's really what our plan will do. Um, and so a, a, at the end of the day, this should be between a woman and her doctor. The government bureaucrats should simply not be at that table. I support more freedom for all Coloradans. And just back to the question of, uh, I, we, we have a constitutional ban on state funding uh, for abortions. Would you ever uh, support overturning that? Well, you're bringing up another, so again, I'm, look, I'm willing to look at anything. Again, the lens that I would look at through, does it protect the freedom of Coloradans, mm -hmm. right? Does it empower women? Uh, is it good for our state? Um, if you're adding in something that is money, you look at the fiscal aspects too. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but fundamentally, again, I think that this is a choice between a woman and her doctor. My, my opponent has said she will rip up that protection. Mm -hmm. I mean, she actually even ripped it up uh, symbolically. Let's hope she doesn't get in there to do it literally, because that law that protects choice in Colorado is all that stands between us and complete abortion bans. Uh, one final question, um, and I appreciate you spending the time with us today. Um, we'd like to end it on something positive. Your, your opponent was appointed uh, to work on a school safety uh, council by your predecessor, John Hickenlooper. Uh, so she, she has shown perhaps some, some moderate areas uh, in the past. Do you have anything you can say about her that uh, you appreciate or you admire about her? Well, school safety is a great one to work on together. I was at a school safety conference this year. I, I'm always, I like good ideas from the left, the right, mm -hmm. the middle, it doesn't matter. A good idea is a good idea. Um, I, I think one thing we have in common, she likes dogs. I like dogs. We both like dogs. Uh, you know, we, we uh, in a few times we've interacted and hope to be able to talk with her more about, about dogs in the future. Uh, but yeah, she, her interest in school safety, her interest in support for parent choice and education, something I share. Yeah. Uh, I founded charter schools, she founded charter schools, so uh, there's some commonalities there as nice, well. Nice to find common ground sometimes. Uh, Governor Polis, thank you so much for, for your time today. Thank you, Nicole. Happy Halloween. Yeah.